Uh, hello, folks. I see that a lot of my trainees have signed in. <laughs> Thank you for signing in. Uh, you folks will be excused from December onwards. I'm going to leave you all alone and bring you all back in January. You see my panelists smiling, right? So they realize that uh, I've been torturing all my uh, so-called kids who have been trained under me. This is how I take care of everyone, uh, using whatever environment I can uh, to pass on knowledge. So anyway, uh, reason for doing this, and if you have seen the poster, you have seen a name called Sidfox, S-I-G-F-O-X. Uh, I don't want to explain too much about who Sidfox is because all these folks that you're seeing online are very much involved with this entity called Sidfox. However, they're going to talk through in the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. You all will get to understand. Actually, at the end of, end of session, you get to understand what is it all about, right? So why cross-border? And then why do we have someone all the way from Thailand? He didn't join the... He didn't join the protest because he's a bit too old, but he always thinks he's young. Uh, our big bro from Malaysia, Vix, uh, there's no protest there. I think there's more about uh, who's going to be the next government. They are cutting short the HSR to stop in Johor, which is like, what the hell? <laughs> and then, of course, they have Afis also from uh, Malaysia side. Then all the way from Singapore, we get Jonathan uh, from Unibis. Okay, I'm going to give a quick intro on uh, this cross-border thing, right? Uh, unlike Europe, and of course, unlike the USA, uh, land transportation is actually critical for success of logistics in the country. But yet, when you look at uh, Asia, okay, in this case, Southeast Asia, we have a very good land mass. We call it land mass in that how are we connected uh, Singapore all the way to Malaysia, Malaysia to Thailand, from Thailand, uh, the privileged country that can go to Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar. And if you're, if you're from uh, Laos, Myanmar, and uh, Vietnam, you can then connect to China. And you know that China is building a road network all the way into Eastern Europe, and then from there into Western Europe. So if you put the entire structure together, it actually sort of makes sense that there should be a very strong uh, cross-border road transportation uh, network that's supposed to be built in Asia. But currently, customs regulatory issues are the one that sort of slow it down. Uh, technology gets a bit exciting and interesting in that these folks that you're seeing online today uh, found a way to be able to track cargo that moves across border. So somehow because they are able to do that, uh, I don't know what the technology is. Actually, I know. Uh, so let's get to the end of the show then, explain what it meant by uh, all these things that they are doing. I will have each of them uh, give an overview from their point of view, also at the same time introduce themselves in a quick manner, each of them got about five minutes. After they introduce themselves, go into uh, the, the thoughts that they have in mind. Uh, once all the four of them have finished, I will then do a QA. and a and then any one of you who are outside uh, or who are watching us and have any questions to ask, I will take the questions from there. So I suppose you are fine. I can't see anyone other than that, uh, my panelists here and all the attendees are actually quite blurred off. I don't even know what's going on. I don't know, I can see the four of you, five of you. Eh? Okay, so let's start. Uh, let's start with uh, Pavin, all the way from Thailand. Pavin, maybe I give it to you, your timing now, so you can share uh, your thoughts. Hi, everyone. Sorry, uh, Kap. First of all, very pleased to eat me, you all here. My name is Pavin, the CEO of Think on Net, uh, the Sick Fox operator in Thailand. First of all, we are really pleased and very excited to join with uh, Exparanti and Unabis today. Uh, this is a very exciting forum to share you our collaboration in this region. Before I give you the uh, deep dive into the details, let me give you some of the background and the big picture of our region. As everyone knows, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and, and also the economic shutdown is all over the globe, disrupting our billion of life and also jeopardize our business. You know what, uh, before pandemic, the World Bank also forecast the world GDP is about 5.8, while comparing with latest forecast, just only 4.2. But the good news is our region, which is uh, Southeast Asia, is growing one point above the global average, or about 5.6, uh, 5.2, right? Why? There are several factors. First of all, we are the third most populous in the world, right? In all among the country in Southeast Asia, combination of 640 million people as a region, we are the third most populous in the world. 
and almost uh, contribute 8.5% of the total world population. The economic in this region also contribute, con uh, considered as a seventh largest uh, economy in the globe, right? And since there are and more and more people also requiring um, uh, disposable income and also increasing of the middle class population. So a lot of people also moving themselves into the cities or we call rapid urbanization. Since rapid urbanization also expect a lot of consumer goods and growing demand of the uh, e-commerce and also the online, right? So that's why uh, the uh, critical elements regarding about the logistics and also the cross border is very crucial in our region. Okay, on what we do, right? In terms of the uh, logistic and supply chain industry, the potential of cross uh, sector full scale of collaborative economy uh, is of too large to ignore. With IoT technologies, uh, we can collect all of the big data. Uh, from warehousing, cargo management, to freight, and last mile delivery. As a result, uh, we can get the laser sharp data driven supply chain, which is not only drive value through optimization of the current process, but also open up for the new uh, business model in the future. For us, uh, things on it in Thailand, we also providing the total IoT solution. Uh, from the uh, uh, consulting, uh, including smart devices, also the smart connectivity. We also uh, thinking through about the platform and the processes and also including with the application. Right? Not only that, we also thinking through about the R&D and how to improve and optimize the cost and uh, ex ex uh, consider enhance the customer experience. Not only the total IoT solutions, uh, we make it simple end to end. Uh, with things on it and expanded collaboration, we boost up with the end to end fleet tracking management between Thailand and Malaysia. Right? We also offering the practical and hassle free track and locate with no roaming charge for company to keep their asset tracking, including with trailer, container, pallets, and from dispatch to arrival, supporting businesses to deliver consistent services across international border. And we bought uh, things on it and also exploranty. Uh, we use the asset tracking and transport monitoring and leveraging on SIGFOC uh, LP WAN network, right? or we call low power wide area technology. And this LP WAN network also providing the flexibilities affordability and also end-to-end -end the view of the supply chain. And this smart logistic solution also offer improved safety for warehouses and for fleet vehicle, offering business uh, value chain uh, security, peace of mind and also increased efficiency. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Pavin. Uh, Pavin give an overview of uh, the economic or the, at least the macroeconomic environment of Southeast Asia, uh, we know why we are attractive uh, as a market by ourselves, uh, but we also know that uh, if uh, the Southeast Asia market remains fragmented, uh, the challenges will continue right, in attracting the right investors or at least the right companies to locate their bases, their manufacturing bases here. Uh, COVID-19 essentially created a new scenario uh, you can look at both sides of the coin. On one side, uh, a very challenge, challenging scenario where supply chains are being broken down. Uh, the exciting part is that because supply chains are being broken down, it means that some new supply chains can actually be created. So I believe that from the Southeast Asia point of view, uh, with the new supply chain created, materials and goods movement has to be enhanced. So the cross-border become even more challenging. Eh? So here I have uh, Jonathan, Jonathan from uh, Unibis Singapore. Jonathan can provide a bit of uh, a technical overview on the Sigfox technology next, as well as explain uh, what does Unibis in Singapore do to help uh, in terms of this cross-border uh, transportation network. Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Paul. All right, uh, I'm Jonathan. I am from Unibis, uh, the Singapore office. Just out here from Thailand, then out here from Singapore. Uh, so I'm going to share to you a little bit on the technology of Sigfox. Right, uh, Pavin share with us, okay, what is the opportunity? But how do you actually deliver it? All right, 
So I'm going to share uh, using this IoT network that we call the Sigfox network, which is also what is commonly classified as the low power wide area network. So you might be wondering, hey, how does this technology or this, 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 this network or this IoT network help us in being able to be able to provide data for the supply chain? So I'm going to list up to you a very four simple areas to see what is unique about this network. First and foremost, I think everybody looks at cost. All right, we all look at total cost of ownership. And you want a network that is able to help you deploy very quickly. And one of the best, one of the most crucial things as we see as the driver in getting us to have this uh, IoT network and when customers come to us, is because of its low power consumption. That's why it's called low power area network. Then you might ask yourself, hey, why is low power such an important thing? All right, how are we are talking about high power stuff, all right? Uh, because you're looking up, if you want to do a tracking across a huge area over a long period of time, you want to be able to put a device, once you put it in there, it can last a very long time. Okay, if I say put an example, I give you an iPhone 12 right now, and they say, you hold this iPhone 12, you use it to do tracking. Of course, it does the work, it does perfectly. But uh, within one day, battery is flat. Then, is it, is it useful as a device to do tracking of your cargo? Absolutely not right, because it lasts more than that. And uh, if I tell you, oh, it lasts two months, is it good enough? Well, still not good enough, why? It means that every two months, you need to get your, car, your stuff up there to replace battery, and that is expensive. And not only some are expensive, some are also impossible. So it's important to be able to have devices that can last a very long time. So we're looking about two years, three years, four years, or even more, all right? so. And uh, there are devices, tracking devices, that can last enough to seven years or even up to 11 years. Imagine a de tracking device that can last up to even seven to 11 years without changing battery. It means you just find and forget, it does the tracking for you. And that, when you, if you are able to do it, will then represent a huge saving in terms of operating costs. That's number one. Number two, you look at item there, it's also low cost, low capex, opex. What do you mean by low cost? Sigfox is a, a network that actually is very low, cheap and uh, cost effective in its subscription. We all know that 3G, 4G and so forth is expensive. Even MBLT is quite expensive, right? But Sigfox offers the lowest cost among all these networks per messages, right? So we don't have to charge you a huge amount of data, huge amount of cost to run. But we know that some, for tracking, you just need small amount of data. So that's why the cost is very low and we target it in that area. Thirdly, I think this can be an exciting part. Huh? Okay. It is a truly global network with it is 70 countries. And right now, uh, you can see in this case, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore, they have one seamless network on Sigfox. All right. And this is really unusual. Really unusual. Of course, you have it in 3G, but you know that 3G is going off in some places. And you might do it in 2G. Singapore doesn't even have 2G anymore. You might go 4G or you might go 5G, but all this is actually, first it's expensive, our battery cost is high, and it's not seamless, right? Because it might not, it might change. But Sigfox is one single network that covers all these countries, and beyond that, it can cover up to 70 countries. And lastly, it is very simple to operate, all right? In this, uh, we call this a zero G network. So beyond going to three, four, five G, which is getting more complicated and high power, we have it a very simple lightweight network on zero G, which is simple and easy to use. And also beyond that, all right, uh, beyond, although today we're talking about land, land, but the technology we have deployed, it can also be used on sea, it can also be used on land and even on air. So, we are actually right now doing project with Singapore Airlines, okay, one of the best airlines in the world. We are looking at tracking 20,000 pilots and cargo across all around the world. And we, we have been testing it, deploying it on the ULDs, and, are able to, and we have been collecting data and results. So it has also been able to go seamlessly, air, sea, and land, all right. So actually it's a lot, and beyond that, if you want to go indoor, it is also possible. So in the SIA case, you are tracking both indoor and outdoor. So you see, this is a technology with lots of different possibilities. So I'm not saying, so you need to speak to us and tell us your requirement. We think about it. We help you to craft out a solution. We design, 
and we give you the best possible, most cost-effective way of doing it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I don't know whether the folks who are listening understood uh, zero G. It's not OG. So those who are from Singapore, it's not a departmental store. Uh, zero G, one G, two G, three G. If you understood that, then you understand that as a signal uh, communication network. And and actually, one of the reasons why I got so excited in uh, moderating this particular session is uh, I know that in the early days uh, when I was working in some of my uh, companies in logistics, the tracking of trucks across uh, borders were using phone, which means SIM card, which means roaming charges. And uh, what is interesting about this new network is that there is no roaming charges and using a low power wide area network whereby uh, even the energy source can last for 7 to 11 years uh, makes the device a lot more viable. So that was the exciting part. But I think we didn't go into very much how it's being used. So maybe this time now we get uh, Vix from uh, Experandi to talk through some of the use case uh, of what you all were doing or what you all are doing now for a company called, is it a yellow company? Yeah, thanks Paul. Uh, hi, I'm Vix from Experanti. Thanks for this opportunity to speak. I'm actually excited. This is one of the first times to sh showcase how three Sigfox operators are collaborating and maximizing the Sigfox technology. We also have Afis there. He will speak after that. Uh, let me just talk about uh, X Pranti very briefly before I give you a, a case study. So uh, X Pranti is actually two years old. Uh, we officially launched in November 2018. So now it's November 2020, the two years old. We actually have covered 85% of the Malaysian population. Uh, we'll continue to densify the network up to 95%. Um, you know, the, the way we, we deployed is actually to support the government initiative uh, because Kazana is one of the shareholders of Sigfox. And uh, our objective is to ensure that we are supporting the Industry 4.0 uh, adoption in the country and also in the region. Um, and like I, if you look at the, the presentation, this uh, page, Zero G is designed to support and complement 4G and 5G. It is not competing. So everyone needs to remember that. That's why the low power wide area network uh, and 4G and 5G is high bandwidth. It's designed perfectly to complement. So I'll share some of the, pro one of the projects in the next slide. That's why it's designed. Um, now let's move to the next slide. So I'll give you an example. This is a case study. So it's a very large logistic company. Uh, they, they had an issue between the cross border between uh, Malaysia and Thailand on the northern side. Uh, we, we discussed with them, they said uh, the issue is uh, we, when we, we, we hand over the container to their counterpart at the border, the Thailand counterpart, they go in all the way to, to, the, to Bangkok. And then when, when the container comes back, they really don't know when it's coming back. It takes about two to three days, sometimes waiting time. All right. So they told us the problem. Uh, the form statement. So we say, okay, we have a solution because we have a global network, we can roam. All right. And then therefore we actually uh, did a we actually did a pilot to showcase. They didn't want to believe. They say, sure, we can roam, no roaming charges, the device is plug and play, there's no uh, power source, because they were using uh, GSM to track the 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 primers, all right, but they couldn't track the continent. We said, let's just do it. So when we when we did the pilot, they were amazed. They are they are Waiting time at the border from two to three days was only less than six hours. So there was a massive saving, almost 80% of time. Time is money. Uh, eventually today, almost a thousand containers and trailers are tracked cross border with this largest logistic company. Uh, they like to keep it quiet. It's private because you know competition, logistic industry is very competitive, but they are the one of the largest uh, 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 logistic company in Malaysia. Now, what we did was we, provided an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, so we, we provide the device, the network, the Sigfox, the application, the mobile app, and the dashboard. That is then, therefore, the mobile app, the, the supervisors can actually use it. The, the drivers can check when the, the containers are coming. The dashboard is more for uh, reporting and stuff. Now, how we do it, I, I go back to what Jonathan and Pavin said, it's a journey, all right? We take our clients through a journey. First is phase one is, automation where we help them capture the data of all their assets so that they can actually visualize where the assets are. 
And over a period of time, they start to optimize the usage of their assets, all right? And because they want to, so they will actually, we have a, another case study where the client didn't realize they had uh, five gen sets sitting in a corner, not utilized. With our tracker, they realized they found that out. They were actually going to buy more gen sets. Now, they, when they found out that they actually don't need the gen sets, they said, hey, we realized some of the gen sets are underutilized. So that's how you have optimized the, uh, the asset tracking over a period of time. Now, phase three, you need more data. You think six to 12 months data, you start to predict. So you can start to predict utilization, okay, more based on traffic, this month, festive season, there's an increase of tracking purposes. Therefore, we need to have more assets. You start to predict, and then you can also manage your, your, your customer. So it's a phase by phase journey. Uh, I also like to say that part of the tracking, we realized there's a lot of complementary uh, work with the mobile operators, then with, with X Paranti, that we collaborate with the mobile operators where high bandwidth and low bandwidth, so that we provide an end-to-end -end solution to the customer. Um, one of the things we, we, we do in Malaysia that I think the others do, we work through an ecosystem of partners that go to market. Our objective is to share this knowledge uh, of the technology and the use cases and how to go to market and the benefits to our partners. We have local SIs, validated partners that go to market. They actually uh, sell or deploy the solutions for their customer. So that therefore we spread the, the, the the knowledge and the, and solve problems more effectively. All right. Um, so that's basically it for me. Thanks, Paul. Back to you. Thanks, Vic. Also, I thought that uh, didn't explain what IoT is. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we are being a bit presumptuous, right? So Internet of Things. Uh, maybe I will explain a bit more before I let Hafiz come in, in that uh, technologies like SIGFOX essentially or at least uh, accentuated or increase the, uh, increase the intensity of use of Internet of Things. So what uh, Vix talks about in collecting the data because I can collect the data and what Vino is asking, how frequently is the location transmitted? From what I understand is how frequently do you want it to be transmitted? Because every signal that you send up <laughs> costs you money. Eh? So, so you don't need to send a signal every second, likely every minute or maybe every 30 minutes, but that depends on how you do it. But that's what we have. We have an expert coming in, or I thought that he's called the ambassador to seek folks, Hafiz. So being an ambassador means that you only say good things, right? So let Hafiz say good things about what seek is all about. Introduce at least the technology before I put you folks into a Q&A, right? Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me here uh, to speak on this platform. So my name is Hafiz Hassan. I'm the CEO of Singularity Aerotech Asia and uh, also the co-founder of the company. So um, I'll try to do justice to the status of a Sigfox ambassador for the Southeast Asia. Um, so, but before I do that, let me give you a bit of background. So my experience is in the deep tech area, uh, especially in the aerospace uh, design and engineering work. So that's, the, that's been my, my professional experience for the last uh, 18 to 19 years. And one thing that you have to uh, appreciate is that uh, Sigfox, even though it's an old technology uh, uh, based on the radio frequency technology back in 1880s, uh, early 1900, uh, it has found a new purpose in life because of the robustness of the solution uh, that provide a certain level of uh, business uh, value proposition because it's purpose built for a small data packet uh, that can provide a low powered uh, wide area network capabilities to um, the end users out there. So it's interesting to note is that Sigfox was actually developed uh, through the aerospace uh, valley in uh, Toulouse, France, where essentially a lot of uh, other aerospace uh, companies are based as well. So there's definitely some level of technology transfer going from aerospace into this application of technology. And uh, for us as a practitioner of the technology or adopter of the technology, what appeals, what appeals to us in terms of the technology capability is the simplicity and affordability of the solution. If you go with other providers, uh, generally it requires a bit more processing time on the back end to integrate the solution. 
and also uh, it, it will cost you a little bit more. So in so far as Singularity Aerotech Asia is concerned as an end-to-end -end solution provider, similar to you know, peace and all this, what we are interested in doing is to solve our customers' problems. We don't want to be spending too much time in maturing the technology. So we always try to bake our technology in a mature ecosystem, vibrant ecosystem, where we can then develop a layer of solutions on top of it that can go to, can be adopted by the market very, very quickly. So the, can, so the client can then uh, uh, benefit from that particular solutions. So in this case, we work very closely with Xpranti as network operator in Malaysia and uh, plenty of device makers in the Sigfox ecosystem. And the way that Sigfox has developed the architecture is also very easy for you know, the traditional device makers to come in and, and become part of the ecosystem. And that makes it a very vibrant ecosystem. There's always new device that's available. You can pick and choose the device based on your own requirements without having too much of a headache in developing your own device in that sense. So that gives the system integrator like us a lot of flexibility and we can focus on bringing the value to the business, to the end clients where we focus on solving that particular problems. Why Sigfox, like I said, and as Jonathan has explained, the sort of value proposition is simple, secure, affordable architecture. So in this case, we don't have to worry about the availability of simple infrastructures like the, the mains, the electricity. It has a vibrant ecosystem. We got thousands of device makers out there with approved devices that we can easily pick and choose. And you got global standards and availability globally. So that makes it one of the most competitive platform that you guys can have to start your journey into IoT. Thank you. Sounds good, Hafiz. Uh, like everybody else, maybe uh, I shall articulate for all my folks who are outside listening. Uh, we're always very interested in business model. And then now we are looking at three different parties who are trying to collect money from us. So we calculate, uh, are we paying times three? You know? So here, here I go, right? How does Sick Fox bring uh, that, I mean, three or four of you together and how does this really work? So basically my, my question is, is there a business model uh, that we should consider? I'm sure some of you are selling devices. Uh, some, of, some of you have devices that you put together uh, or do we get our own devices and then we work with you all to put onto our trucks uh, to track our movement, our cargo movement or put into our cargo in this case and track the cargo movement across uh, Southeast Asia. Can one of you take this up? So, uh, Paul, this week's just to answer your question, mm. the, 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 the beauty of Sigfox or the operators is we are very modular. Uh, a partner can come to us and say, I need a, a solution based on the problem statement. We help them build a case and we deploy it end to end the device the platform and the, in the show, the use case I showed you, it was actually from uh, Oyster from digital method that we use. It was a proven device uh, deployed worldwide, it's proven, so we use that device. Then the platform is telematics, another proven, and then we, we deploy the whole solution for the client. All right, that's one model. And another model is a, a partner will come to us and say, listen, I just want your connection. I brought my own device. That's fine, all right? Another one will say, listen, I got my own platform. I just want you to give me the device and the connection. We do that. So we actually very modular and that's why we have an ecosystem of partners. We work and we're very unique in that case because at the end of the day, it's about solving the problem and helping achieve the business case for the client. Jonathan, uh, Pavin, you want to add? What, what is the, why is, wait, uh, why is the business model like that? Uh, well, just now there was one question. It said, how frequently is the location transmitted? And I sort of says that based on my, uh, based on my layman knowledge is I'm sure you charge for data that is uploaded into Sigfox and then Sigfox transfer the data back to whatever uh, application systems that I have to collect the data, right? So how does the business model actually work? Right, the Sigfox business model actually uh, is very simple. The pricing is very simple. It goes by the a tier of different bands for different kind of uh, data. So you may send, let's say you, you, may, you may need as little, maybe just two messages a day. All right, so it's a very lightweight one. Or you may require to 
at maybe even more than 140 messages a day. So based on the number of messages or uplink or downlink, you have different pricing tiers. Different countries might have a, different, a bit of difference in terms of pricing, but it's, it's all about the same. And the beauty of this is that uh, unlike, and, uh, unlike the maybe other models where you have different operators or different networks, Sigfox is one single network, which means to say, let's say you, you are based in Malaysia and you go to VIX and uh, you, you buy a Sigfox net, you buy a certain number of subscriptions, you, and you can ultimately roam to Thailand, you can ultimately roam to Singapore, and you do not even need, it's just one, you don't even need to actually talk to Thailand or in Singapore guys because you only, you only deal with one single network mm. operator and that will cover everyone. So it's very, very simple. So um, it's depending on the number of messages and typically people may have the perception it's up to 140 messages and just stop there, right? Uh, it's, that is only a commercial uh, uh, limitation. It's not limited technically. So depending on the use case, we actually can recommend you the right kind of uh, network uh, pricing. And all in all, in all the we have six, uh, Unibase have sold more than a million connectivity, uh, more than one million connectivity, and uh, so far nobody have actually complained to us about network price. Uh, usually, the pricing, the difficulty is usually more on the whole total solution. We have so many other things that you need to take off. So in the end, the network price is actually the least of anybody concerned. Yeah. <laughs> so you you sold a million connection. I don't think one connection is one one dollar or ten dollars. Or maybe one thousand dollars. Oh no wonder you are so rich. That day I saw you driving along the road in a Bentley. What the hell? You take money from us and buy a car? Uh, no, I don't think it's that expensive. Anyway, just joking, right? Okay, so I oh, from, oh, supply no, chain, I Bentley. <laughs> from supply chain Asia side, we sort of link up with both. Uh, we call them the logistics service providers, LSPs, as well as we call them shippers. So essentially, the end user. Uh, if I'm a logistics service providers, I run transportation or what we trans transporters in doing haulage across border. Or if I'm a user uh, and I work with either LSPs or I may want to figure out a way to track my own cargo. Maybe can you explain that what are the benefits that I can expect whether I'm an LSP or I'm a user if I, I tap on a network like this that you have? Okay. What do I gain? I mean, if I, if I have, if somebody that I work with has sick folks or or somebody that I, I'm trucking across a boundary between, say, Malaysia and Thailand, and the logistics service providers actually, or me as a logistics service provider, subscribe to your service. So I, I give you a very good example. Let's look at a customer journey, all right? Uh, we have a solution that actually can trade a cold chain, all right? So imagine the, the logistic company is providing cold chain services, and they want to track they are this cold chain and imagine mcdonald's is using them to send those meat patties across all the mcdonald's outlets all right so mcdonald's the uh, the client logistic company is that so imagine the solution is the logistic company will know the driver is picked up all right and he's, he's picked up all the assets he, he knows the the meats in there they can see okay that the, the refrigerator is running very well the temperature is monitored the location is monitored, boom, it's moving. Now, for McDonald's, all the outlets, they can say, okay, there's five trucks going there and we're gonna arrive at this location and they can see the, the quality of the, the meat, the temperature there, all right? So because it's their product that needs to go to the outlet. So they, they will be given access by this logistic company so that they pay for this service. They know the quality of the meat patties arrive at the end of the, uh, McDonald outlet is of quality, all right? There are many cases where the driver drives, turns off the engine, boom, the refrigerator is gone. He goes, has his lunch, he come back. Then he turns on the refrigerator, come back again, the meat gets spoiled and nobody knows. Then when he arrives at the, uh, at the McDonald's outlet, the guy looks at the temperature in the refrigerator, oh, it's good, they take, but they did not see, they did not monitor it throughout the journey. So there is a value for the logistic company to ensure they're providing good service. It's important for the end client to know that their product is well taken care and it's arriving in a timely manner to their end site. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can share another example. Slightly, it may be slightly different example. Uh, 
it's because right now it's 4.30 already. So it's near evening time. So I think everybody feel like having a beer. All right, I'll share an example, a story of beer. <laughs> Uh, we we did a, we are now currently doing a project in Australia with this company called Convoy. When uh, this is this is a beer cat supplier, you know, when you bring fresh beer in the, the metal container, so they have about seventy thousands of these all over Australia, and you know Australians are crazy beer drinkers, so it's it's important to get their beer fresh. And uh, and this company want to be able to check where at what point they are from the factory to the brewery, to the storehouse, and to the bars and the restaurants and then come back. And because previously they keep losing them and they don't know where is it, or it's full, but it's somewhere stuck somewhere, or it's lost, some, or it's empty and it's not being utilized. So what we do for them is to put in a tractor, all right, 70,000 of them across whole Australia. And with it, we are able to track the location where you go to. We are able to track the temperature so that we know that, hey, come on, are you guys maybe in our store directly? And because we put a sensor on the motion, so we know, for example, is it is it this angle or this angle, this angle, and so forth. And based on that, with analytics, we are able then to be able to know at what stage is it is it being mounted, is it being dismounted, all right. Even though it's not a contact switch, but just based on motion. So then the company is able to accurately track at what stage it is and be able to proactively do replenishment, proactively get a uh, and and also move them up. So that is an example of how it's not just about tracking or location, but you can actually put additional sensors in there. So that actually provide additional sensors. Yeah, like what Vic said is what is also the temperature and and monitoring the cold chain. So in terms of shipping, also uh, shipping company also been talking because right now shipping is actually worldwide. And if you want a network that actually can track across a huge number of countries, 70s on one single network, right? So Sigbox is good be able to do that. And even in area where, where there's no sick box, okay, one possibility is to then blend it with different network like an MBLT or even blend it with 3G with different sensors so that you're able to track accurately. And uh, thirdly is, uh, so, so all these are possible, right? Thank you. Mm. you third, I think someone was asking and says that uh, uh, does the tracking applies both S and C as well? And my understanding is yes, right? So, yeah. yeah, but of course, our topic here uh, to Mac uh, is that we also, we are definitely focusing on cross-border trucking, right? But from what I understand is that the SIGFOX uh, technology allows you to collect signals uh, across uh, both A and C. That's my understanding. Huh? So anyway, uh, there is one interesting yeah. question uh, that goes into being a 0G network can hackers break into the network and take control of the device easily? Any such cases being reported? I, I am also curious, right? So uh, one of you can answer now because whatever you say is recorded. Uh. Yeah. So if let's say there's a hacking and we go, and go to insurance, ask insurance to claim from you. Ken, uh, okay, you want to go for this one before I add in? <laughs> I think the, the, the thing that uh, Paul mentioned, I would, I would say that uh, our uh, network is very high security. I just like to echo um, uh, uh, Wick and also John mentioned pre uh, re recently. Uh, our network, first thing first, is about very secure, right? Because our message is very uh, small and very simple. And uh, the way that we doing is that uh, we broadcast the message and we message three times, uh, and and ensure that the message has been delivered uh, securely. Right. And beyond that, our uh, network and in terms of the cloud, we has been encrypted and very highly secure based on international standard. I think we, you can also helping me to elaborate more. Okay. So the, the Sigfox uh, network uh, cannot be jammed. It's an ultra narrow band. All right. Uh, you can jam the GSM signal. You cannot, the 4G signal, 5G, you cannot jam the Sigfox network. It's proven. Uh, I give you an example in South Africa. Uh, they use uh, because they they have insured purposes for vehicles and then for hijacking and getting stolen. So when you use a GSM tracker, you know, you plug into the vehicle battery. The guy who steals the car first thing you do is remove the GSM tracker. That's it. You can't find the vehicle or you you jam it. You can't. So what they've done is they put a Sigfox tracker as a call as a secondary tracker inside the vehicle. Even you, you jam the uh, signal, you still can check the car because the Sigfox network 
sends out the pulse data. So it's very robust. It's also used in other parts of the world as a secondary tracker for logistic companies where uh, some of the assets get, uh, you know, trying to be hijacked. They'll come in with two, they jam the GSM signal so you cannot request for help. You can't use a mobile phone, but the CFOX network is still continuously sending out data. All right. So there's the, the beauty about it. And adding to what Pavin said, the data is super small, right? It's like high bandwidth, it's like, like a jigsaw puzzle, right? High bandwidth. You take a, a image, you know it's a door of a house. For Sigfox, the data is so small in bytes. You pick up, it's like sand. You do not know what it is, all right? So you need, so the, if any hacking happens, you can record, it's recorded. It's not in the Sigfox network. It is in the customer's platform, all right? So Jonathan, anything else you want to add? Uh, they want to agree. Don't let them talk already. I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay, well, that was a good one, right? Uh, when somebody asks questions like, if I'm an importer, how does it benefit me since a transportation be handled by the this company? And then another almost similar question is, will the tech be made compulsory to track transmit data logger in an ultra cold chain? So maybe I answer this and then you folks ask, tell me whether I'm right. If I am a Pfizer, I'm an AstraZeneca, I'm a Mon Mondana, right? Mondana, and I'm transporting uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, it is my responsibility to make sure that my vaccine is not compromised in any form or ways. It is my responsibility to ensure that this can be articulated, communicated, and confirmed before it's finally injected into a patient. So... I don't think it's about sick fox only. I think it's about the fact that they need to find whatever process and ways to make that happen. I see you nodding your head means I'm correct. Huh? So the benefits really is this. Who really benefit me? Huh? I'm not going to get injected with a COVID-19 vaccine and then the vaccine got compromised along the way. All right. I got one question uh, which was really that. Huh? Uh, someone asking, uh, Mark, Mark Palin is actually from uh, Kunenaga. So he says, uh, who do you see as your main customer? Shippers, shipping company, and or non-assets 3PLs? Jonathan? Right. Um, actually, all are possible because we think, but we see that one key, one, one big driver early on is one example is actually Michelin. Michelin is actually not neither of these three. They actually, in fact, they are the end user. All right. They are actually like the, the one who produce a product. Because for once, why, why they, in fact, that is actually an interesting one. So I was talking to one large um, um, company here about in the supply chain. They said, the rest is because they actually are the guys that actually look at it from end to end. Because they produce it and they finally deliver it. And they finally need the product out in the customer space. So that's why, and, uh, and the sick box tracking is able to track. And then the uh, as well as the shippers, they are actually part of it, right? So with it, they actually will, they will, they will be, they will benefit from being able to do the tracking of the asset, but it's only part of it, part of uh, the, the whole value chain. So in, in all of these companies, uh, we, we do have inquiries and we are still exploring what would be the most cost effective way of doing it. I, we, 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 we it's right from business standpoint. And we are talking to them and working up with them the business case. So, um, but so far, I must say the large, very the very large ones are usually those who look at it at the end because that's, they reap the most number of returns. And of course, the thing is, I must say, the other thing about this tracking is, I'm also sure is that um, because the cost of the device is not trivial, I mean, it's about $100 or so, it's not something that you use one time and throw away. So it is useful and it's important that the device, that the tracking device is put onto asset that will go out to the destination and come back again. So there's a circular motion, right? So uh, maybe it's important, then that is where we, they are, they are, uh, we are able to help you do that, to be able to make sure that the track, when you go to destination place, we are able to bring it back again so that we can able to reuse it and optimize and bring down the cost, right? Okay, I'm going to do one last question from Jasni. Uh, Jasni says that Gartner Report says only 26% of IoT installations are successful. Why is this? Uh, tech adoption issue or user attitude? Or I add one more for you, Jasni, or lack of knowledge. Eh? So okay. why is it only 26%? It's almost like uh, whatever that goes out sort of fails. 
Okay, no. it's a bit hard. It's a, a little bit tricky a question. All right, uh, you maybe the answer is that because the IoT actually, if you look at it, um, the if you don't machine the machine end to end cars like you've been there for years. All right, but the LP when kind of technology like low power air they were only started four years back, and it only take traction about only one to two years ago. All right, so as in the early stage of any technology. All right, I think. Uh, a lot of companies have not been able to fully understand it yet. And uh, right now, what we see is we, we have some mass deployment. For example, the one even just outside of the others is the one that the tracking the beer cats about 70,000 in Australia. So, and we see in TikTok's world, there's machine lane and so forth. So the thing is, uh, I think we are still in the, in, in the beginning or the early stage of, the, of, this, of this adoption of this technology in this uh, industry. And uh, and then, so I feel uh, it's a bit too early to see uh, uh, and, and, and to judge. So in the early days, there will naturally be some failures. In the earlier days, there'll be certain not, uh, people will, will still need time. But we do. We are bullish and we are sure that uh, the next few years is going to be a uh, great adoption. So if you if you even may quote the Singapore government recently when they talk about the growth of the supply chain industry and and uh, and and the, and the need for digitalization. So uh, the general the message that the government has been talking about is that they do see digitalization and as ex, uh, extremely key and components in helping on the supply chain industry. So one of it was also the quote I put in my slides earlier by quoted by Isporan here. He he speak about having a a common platform to be able to cut across all the different countries. And all this platform uh, is only for, make possible if there's the right policy, if there's the right adoption and also the right supporting technology to support all this. Yeah. For me, having worked, having worked with uh, a lot of clients and we also work with some of the, some of the farmers in Malaysia which, who has very low appreciation of the technology. And it's the value proposition of the technology. And in one way, the Sigfox platform, the ecosystem, uh, provides a bit of an advantage because you don't, uh, you're not burdened with the high capex investment, so they don't have to fork out, you know, uh, thousands of dollars just to get started on IoT. So for us, is tackling the, the the quick wins and providing that added value immediately. So then they, that gives them a level of confidence that the solution actually works. It helps to make their job easier. And along the way, you have to coach and uh, unlock the additional value and change the mindset and the, the, the culture bit by bit. It's not something that you can uh, solve overnight. It's a continuous process. And you got to um, hold their hands a little bit. The adoption is going to be low. It's not quite as, um, as natural as what you say, the popularization of social media out there, the way that people are using it. Because as technology is quite dry, you know, it's you're handling bits, data, and all that. It's not sexy, so naturally, people uh, if, if it doesn't bring the immediate benefit to them from social perspective, it's not worth their time. So you got to make you got to focus on the quick wins for them. So that's the way that we've done it uh, for a number of farms that we've uh, successfully deployed the solution on. We make the the business model very appealing. Within one crop cycle, they will be able to see the cost saving that they can get and the transparency and the traceability of data help them to get a certain level of certification so they, they can sell their produce better. And in this case, um, you can also tie the, uh, the data that being produced from the production stage to the logistics. So that provide a real end-to-end -end visibility of their farm produce up to the, the sellers and the end customers. So <clears throat> it's a huge endeavor, but you got to be able to check, you got to be able to uh, turn into small pieces that people can actually buy and see, oh, there's quick win here, quick win here, over a period, so they can eventually get the, the bigger benefit of IoT implementation. Yeah, in Singapore, in Singapore oh. my government call it the bite-size model. Everything yeah. into bite-size, like all training into bite-size. And, uh, and like what the, the rest of you are asking, um, 
So is it the end of it that we cannot adopt? I don't think so. I think uh, it's more about uh, how risk adverse are you and then how folks like them can help you mitigate the risk before you take on. So adoption of new technologies has always been this, the innovators come first and then the laggards come at the end, right? And that's exactly how the marketing part works. I got one last question before I let everybody go. And the question goes this, because we only have Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore on sick folks. So I'm going to assume that sick folks is not in Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam and China. And Indonesia and Brunei. Can you guys tell me what is going on? One of you. Yep. All right. Uh, can I take this? So basically, this is a power of SIGFOB, uh, Paul and everyone, because now you can see from the previous creation, uh, the IoT challenges li li related with the, the use cases. Nowadays, uh, even everybody in, in these three countries, we still all new. Our company is still new, like two, two or one year. But you know what? We are the collective uh, people of expertise. Uh, while we use the same technology as a SIG for global network, right? Right now we have expanding up to more than 70 countries worldwide already. For me, I don't need to innovate again. I don't need to fail or do failure in the past that somebody did it already. I just use the same technology, the same knowledge and to adapt and customize in terms of the customer requirement. I would strongly believe that with the collective network, with the collective knowledge and the expertise with among the SIGFOC operator, we are so helping and elaborate to customize and also to, to fit in particular flavor of the countries because it's just like food, right? Thai food may be different than other food like Malaysian food, Singapore food, right? We, but uh, in the IoT, we use the, the same network we might probably use the same uh, sensor and smart device as well, but we do some slightly change some of the flavor and there's some slightly change of the platform, but we do all the same technology. Uh, in conclusion, I would believe that uh, the SIGFOC network is going to be more and more and coming on the way. Uh, and also we, with the collective expertise, we are strongly believe that we can fit uh, with every requirement in every verticals in the industry. Any uh, add-on, uh, Wick and John? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's Sigfox Indonesia, just to let everyone know, the Sigfox Indonesia. Uh, they watch this space the next two to three years, you will see uh, Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Vietnam soon. Uh, there's a lot of excitement happening, it's just a matter of timing. Uh, yeah. So you'll see that going, uh, I think it's important. Uh, Paul, I just want to quickly take this opportunity just to raise a point about the question that Justin raised, I think was important. Mm -hmm. Why the adoption is uh, slow or the not high success rate, I think it's two ways. It's also the customer and the solution provider. We tend to sell technology, but we're not selling a, a solving a problem. So there's old way of, I got a sexy technology, let me sell to you, no, it's about problem solving. The other thing is we have to understand they look at technology to solve the problem, but you have to look at the people, process, and technology. So a lot of companies don't understand that. They say, I'm going to put a new technology. I'm hoping to solve the problem, but they're not addressing the process and the people. So you must remember technology requires the processes and the people to come together to increase the adoption of IoT or Industry 4.0. So I think it's very important. Everyone understands that. Okay, sounds good. Uh, folks, I'm going to hold the rest of the guys longer than this, guys and girls. Uh, thank you for being part of this discussion. I'm sure there's a lot more happening in the IoT world and especially in the signal world. So for now, uh, I'm going to let the four of you go. Uh, Unibis team, you want to take back the order of the day? Oh, of course, I'm going to let myself go as well. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Su, su Hui, uh. Thank you, Paul. And on behalf of uh, everyone at Unibis, Experianti, and things on net, thanks for joining us this uh, afternoon. I think, uh, great job, Paul. You really uh, asked a lot of questions on behalf of uh, our, our very good audience here. I think that the questions were very, very good and very on point about the topics that were discussed. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I, we will be in touch very soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you, folks. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.